Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Guitaristas. Happy New Year to you. This is my last show of 2022. 52nd show of the year, 52 weeks. It's been amazing. It's gone quick. It's been brilliant. Thank you all for supporting me this year and watching the show and uh, encouraging me really to, to buy all these guitars to review for you. I've bought loads. I've sold quite a few as well, actually. More than more than I thought, actually. We'll talk, talk about that a little bit more next week for the first show of the new year, okay? But for now, this is part three of our roundup of everything that happened in 2022, okay? All the guitars that I bought, mucked around with, and um, reviewed, yeah. So part three, today we're going to talk about some of the more unusual ones, some of the more unique ones, I suppose. The projects we got involved in, you know, the guitars we upgraded and <laughs> the lessons we learned there. And at the end, um, sort of a discovery for me, really, and my own, my personal favourite guitar of this whole year that I bought this year. OK, so what we'll do now is we'll get stuck in um, and we'll look at, well, we'll start back in June, I think. We'll start back in June when I saw this unusual thing hanging on the wall of my local music shop. Let's take a look at this. This is the Guild Jet Star. <laughs> So yeah, this is an interesting thing, this, and I, well, okay, I paid £399 for it. It was used, you know, but it's a, it's a, it's a £500 guitar, basically. And I still find it hard to believe that things can be so good for that amount of money. Do you know what I mean? Let's assume this is, you know, a factory fresh fretwork. I mean, wow. Phil McKnight would not ladder his tights on that, I can assure you. This is also the first Guild I'd ever bought, so I didn't know, well, anything about them really. So it was nice to discover also that this is a, a, a reissue of a, of a guitar that, that they made in the 60s. But the Jetstar was, was first introduced in 1963. And Guilds say that this particular model remains faithful to the original. Stretching the truth a little bit. In reality, it's definitely the right shape. Looks good. But this is probably all different. The, you know, tailpiece bridge is different and maybe the pickup configuration. But, yeah, it looks the part. <laughs> this guitar made me think of Billy Gibbons. I guess because he plays a Guild T-Bird or has played a Guild T-Bird. Um, and Billy Gibbons is cool, so this guitar, the Guild Jetstar, wins my award for coolest guitar that I've bought and reviewed in 2022. Yeah. Now, there was no escaping the hype surrounding the new Yamaha Revstar range back in March, was there? All the influencers have clearly been given these guitars to, to look at and um, review. <laughs> so I thought I'd do the same, but obviously the difference here is I pay for my guitars, so I don't have to be nice about it. If it's a bit crap, I'll tell you, okay? So, well, let's have a look, shall we, and find out. As it happens, I actually owned one of the Series 1 Revstars, so I knew it wasn't going to be rubbish. Look, this guitar, I mean, a lot, everyone's said this, it's, it's really well made. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't look like a, a 400 pound guitar. It really doesn't look like a 400 pound guitar and it doesn't sound like a 400 pound guitar. So I think that the praise that everyone's heaped on this is probably entirely justified. <laughs> comfortable and as you can 
now see hopefully on the neck it's got a satin polyurethane finish really nice slick smooth satin it is quite a slim neck on this um i've played it a fair amount now it, it you adjust to it um but at first i found it oh i wasn't sure about this but yeah i did adjust to it so you know and then, and then i know that the neck they're the same across the whole range they don't offer any options as far as i can tell so if you don't like skinny necks, give it a try first or be prepared to make an adjustment. That skinny neck is probably the main reason I sold my Series 1 RS02, I think it was, the P91, with the dry switch that broke, which I talk about in, in this RSE review. Uh, but yeah, fantastic value. For every £99, the, this RSE, the, I'm saying this, that means what I'm talking about now, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that. Um, yeah, three hundred ninety-nine pounds. Fantastic value for that. Really, I mean, a Yamaha so well made for that. As all those YouTubers have no doubt already told you, it's a really fantastic value guitar. And it comes with this great. It comes with a handbook. It's the Yamaha thing, isn't it? I've got these with me motorbikes, and you get a handbook with your guitar, which is fantastic. And an Allen key, which is really handy because, as I said earlier, this this push pull loosens up very easily. So it's from quite often. And it's a bit wobbly. You'll have to tighten that up. So yeah, they lived up to the hype. Great guitars, or certainly the one that I did manage to get hold of was. That was great. That was the only problem, really. You know, availability. I wanted a P90 version. I couldn't get one. Eight months later, I still can't get one in the colour that I want. So next year, maybe. So every now and then, if you're lucky, and put in the hours, of course, uh, you come across a real gem and I was especially excited about this one. I'm quite excited. When am I not when there's a new guitar in front of me? Well, it's not new today. It's not new. It's used. It's quite well used actually. It's, um, it's about 30 years old. It's a 1991. Look, I have to do that because it's a Gibson, a Flying D. Look at that. What a a wonderful guitar that is. Look at that. It's cherry, you can see. It's a real nice dark cherry. And it's, yeah, it's well used. It's 1991, this. So it's got a good old, you know, vibe going on. I needed to have this, so I swapped a bunch of affordable guitars for it. <laughs> My deep dive revealed a little bit more about its history. Right, this is a, it's quite exciting, this, because I've not been under it. I don't know if this is standard or been modified. So let's try and carefully lift it without breaking it any further. Ooh. Here we go. Oh, wow. It's got writing in it. It's not a vintage guitar, but it, it's 1991. So it's, you know, it's got some age to it and you can see that. Okay, what we've got here, apparently, I think that's someone's postcode. I think they've put their postcode in there and that, what a smart idea that is. It looks like 80. I'm going to just blur out obviously the postcode or a bit of it for privacy reasons. But yeah, it looks like this might have at some point belonged to 80. How cool is that? Things like that show that 
These are not just bits of wood and metal. They've got a life of their own, haven't they? Outside of the time that they spend with us. I love that. Serendipity brings this beautiful 30 plus year old Gibson Flying V in, into my custodianship. <laughs> is, that the word? is that the word? Custodianship. I am now the, the proud custodian of a, a Gibson Flying V formerly owned by AD, apparently. Next up, it's another guitar with star in the title. It's a star player. So I appear to have acquired a Dusenberg. <laughs> Here it is. It's a Dusenberg star player TV in transparent orange. It's quite a guitar, so I thought I'd, I thought I'd better show it to you. I've had this a couple of months now, and I'll be honest, I was a bit hesitant to, to review it on the channel lest it destroyed whatever credibility I might have as a purveyor of affordable guitars. But I, you know, I thought it was about time to, to show you. I didn't buy it. I acquired it by way of trades. This is another trade acquisition of mine, which, which I'm quite pleased with. So here I was, proud owner of guitar royalty. I've never known really much about them, apart from the fact that they're meant to be <laughs> the Holy Grail. It, I suppose you could say that. People consider them to be a bit of a, a, a holy grail guitar. Not that I'd necessarily treat it any different. We're going to do a deep dive look at this today. We're going to take it apart. We're going to take a Dusenberg apart and have a look at what's under here and do what we normally do, you know. We're not going to treat it any differently just because it's a, a precision made <laughs> instrument. Ta-da! Neatly cable tied, just to make it awkward for me. Gonna have to clip the cable tie. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. It's, I feel like I'm I feel like I'm defusing a bomb. I've got to try and cut this without it explode. No, not exploding, but without damaging any other wires. And of course, discovered that it's a brilliantly well-made guitar. So, you know, you can't resist having a little dig at the self-styled kings of electric guitar manufacture, can you? Compared to this, Gibson, who... I mean, I've heard it said that they're the kind of the Stradivarius of, of electric guitars. You know, they're the, the precision instrument. Compared to this, the Gibson aren't even trying, to be honest with you. So great guitar, played great, sounded great. But in the final analysis, I didn't really, I didn't really connect with it. I didn't really feel it was for me. It didn't really suit my style of playing. So... It wins my award for uh, best guitar of the year that I didn't really care very much about and sold it fairly quickly. I'm not convinced it's for me. I'm not convinced I can do it justice. That's what, that's what I'm trying to say. I'm not convinced that I can do this guitar proper justice. But it's very much horses for courses, as they say. So the next guitar was right up my street. <laughs> It 
It's the Epiphone Joan Jet Olympic Special. I'm excited, obviously. I'm excited because this is this is right in my wheelhouse, isn't it? This kind of guitar, single pickup, rap over bridge, rock and roll. You know, <laughs> I love rock and roll. <laughs> I then went on to say, with some authority, that Joan Jett hadn't played an Epiphone Olympic special. What Epiphone have done is they've given Joan Jett, as her signature, an Epiphone Olympic special, which she never actually played. I just want to say now, <laughs> sorry, I was wrong. She did have one. She mostly played a Gibson Melody Maker, but she also had a, an Epiphone <laughs> Olympic special. Um, and this guitar is actually a really good uh, recreation of that. So the original, I believe, is now in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But I might also be wrong about that too. So don't take my word for it. <laughs> So I really liked that guitar, but I did I did give it a little bit of a hard time because I thought it was quite expensive and I thought maybe some of the choices were, you know, could have been better for a $600 guitar. It's a bit steep, really. Um, all right, and if you're going to charge 489 put some decent tuners on. <laughs> But now, of course, you know, less than a year later, six hundred dollars seems quite cheap for a Epiphone signature, doesn't it? But it's not just Epiphone. This next one's a Fender signature that got a lot of criticism for the high price. Here it is. I got one. But this time, of course, it was a re-released and revised edition of the Joe Strummer Telecaster. So as a massive Clash fan, I wasn't going to let the price tag put me off. I was going to get one. Joe Strummer. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> As a recreation of an iconic punk guitar, I thought they'd done a really good job, to be honest. This relic job, in close person, it looks great. I'm going to say that now, and we'll do some real close-ups of it. I'm going to drop a couple of close-ups in now, actually, as you can see. It's really authentic. All the layers are there, okay? I say that because I did see some comments early on, well, last week on, on the Fender review, people saying, oh, the the relic job doesn't look good. It does, okay. We did our normal deep dive and uncovered a little bit of a riddle. Whoa, what's that mean? So pick guard. Nice. What's that mean then? So it says, um, C grab three, what's that mean? I might have to uh, do a bit of um, research on that. I have no idea what that means. C grave three. Sounds like a special project, doesn't it? Maybe that's what it means. Maybe what, maybe that's what it is. A special, yeah, like a secret code for this project. Yeah, maybe they do that when they're, you know, when they don't want news to get out. They go, well, they don't call it the Strummer replica. They'll call it Seagrave 3, top secret project.
and somehow along the line three called Dave gets wind of it and lets the secret out. Anyway, you know, or something like that anyway. Lots of people commented on this, so thank you all for that. Apparently Seagrave is simply a brand or a type of um, the nitrocellulose paint or lacquer that they're using on this guitar. I don't think it was particularly expensive. It's on par with the Fender Road Worn series and you get a really nice vintage style hard case with it as well. So yeah, I love it. Gave me a wonderful excuse to dig out and play many of my favorite Clash jams. So check out the full review if you want to hear some of those. Yeah, I love it. I'm keeping it. July, I found a perfect excuse to show off another one of my Fender Mexican signature guitars. It's a Fender Wayne Kramer signature Stratocaster or something like that anyway. Anyway, here it is draped in the uh, Stars and Stripes. So I'd bought this used some time back actually, but then 4th of July, I thought, oh, I'll show it off. Uh, a year or so ago, I think I got this. I thought it'd be nice to review on the channel. I'm not a Stratocaster fan, but I'm a massive MC5 Wayne Kramer fan. So I thought, well, it's bloody cool, isn't it? So I've got to get that. And I thought it'd be interesting to, you know, to, to, to feature on the channel. Um, I'm surprised I haven't done it so far, to be honest with you. So like the Joe Strummer from Mexican Fender, the relic job on this is pretty impressive. I've I, honestly, I've owned custom shop guitars that oh, aren't as good as this. I was really quite impressed with the relic job when I got it. I didn't expect it to be this good, given that it's a, you know, a Fender Mexico. It's none of your master built stuff. It's just a Fender Mexico guitar. Has some great attention to detail. It's got this brilliant neck plate. This tool kills hate. Wayne Kramer. And of course, any opportunity to have a moan about Stratocasters, I will. So I did. I play, I lean heavily on the bridge of guitars when I play them. And you can't do that with this because you just bash your hand against the volume knob. So I straight away had to start adjusting my playing and trying to find another way to anchor myself. And that's one of my main issues with Strats. I bruise my hand and I keep turning them down when I'm playing them. And poking around under the hood revealed another surprise. <laughs> Not quite as nice this time. I think someone might have left a hair there. Ooh. A bit wrong, isn't it? Um, yeah, okay. Look, the, the wiring looks, I mean, it didn't look like, it didn't look like it should come out of the factory like that, does it? Look, it's got a bit of a masking tape on there. I mean, I couldn't say if that's original or not. I can see that it's got 250k pots. So whoever left that hair, they made a bit of a mess of the wiring. I'm not really sure what they've done. I think they might have stolen the original pickups out of it. Not really sure, but whatever, it still sounded pretty good. So I'm looking forward to bringing that out again and, and tidying it up at the very least. And uh, in the meantime, I mean, it does actually, it does actually seem like I've found a Stratocaster that I like. I'll pull that with that one. But 
then talking about strats, I thought, well, why don't I try and fix all the things I don't like about them, such as this stuff? The sound that comes out of it is that thing, isn't it? It's that, it's that twangy kind of thing, you know, that they, that, that sound that Stratocasters make. It isn't me, to be honest with you. Uh, and beyond that, this bloody volume knob's always in the way. Every time I pick one up, I bash it with my hand, because I'm not used to it, because Gibsons have them out of the way. On a Strat, when I'm playing it, I constantly turn the volume down, which is quite annoying. Yeah, I'm going on about the volume control again. So what I thought we would do today is is improve it. Yeah, this this project is, um, let's make a... Let's make the strap better, basically. So yeah, I'm serious. So I decided to move all the knobs and modify it to my favorite pickup configuration, which of course is a single P90. I've got some wire. I've got a pickup. I've got a scratch plate. <laughs> and that's gonna go in like that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm now gonna, I'm now gonna start soldering. I'll speed it up. I won't let you, I won't bore you with all of it. I might stop and talk you through bits and pieces if I think it might be interesting for you. You can always skip forward, you know that guy. Okay. Let's get stuck in. So that's tinning. That's putting a bit of solder on, which makes it easier. where I check what I've done so far. It's easy to get this stuff the wrong way round. <laughs> I think I'm good so far. Like many of you, I'm looking at these pictures, I'm thinking, yeah, there's a glaring difference there. I think what we better do now is test it and see if it works before we go any further. Yeah, I think that would be a good idea before we start screwing anything down, don't you? The thing that I always gets me with this is kind of earth loop hums. Here we go. Right. I'm gonna do it. doesn't work. I did fix it in the end and it wasn't actually the back to front pot that had caused the problem. I think it was just a short somewhere, but I fixed it eventually and it sounded like this. It was a really popular film and I had great feedback um, from everyone on that, so thank you. And I know as a fact that many of you are doing your own Strat single P90 projects as we speak, so uh, good luck guys.
that kind of gave me the encouragement to finish <laughs> another project that I'd had on the back burner for a while, the Fat Cat Mustang. Now, the eagle-eyed amongst you might notice I've got no strings on it. That's because I started this project many months back and uh, it fell at the first hurdle, shall we say. Uh, so uh, while I have sort of screwed the scratch plate and stuff back on, I didn't want to waste a new set of strings, so I've left those off for now. Let me tell you what, what, what the plan was then and the plan still is now. I, w I thought we'd upgrade the pickups to something a little bit posh, okay? I mean, the whole guitar on this is only 108 pounds, so they kind of spent a lot on the pickups. And whilst I'll happily say they sounded great in the review, uh, and they do sound great, and you don't need to change them, I thought it'd be fun, okay? Now, this is a, listen, I thought it'd be fun to change these for a really expensive set. I say that because I know that people are going to go, why would you spend all that money on pickups on a really cheap guitar? Because it's fun, okay? And because we can. That's why we're doing it. And what we're going to put in today, a Seymour Duncan Fat Cat humbucker sized P90s. Each one of these pickups costs more than the guitar itself. I know it's stupid, but it's fun. Now, it also turns out that so many of you have, have done similar things <laughs> with cheap guitars. It's easy to do, and it goes something like this. Right, so I guess the best way to tackle this project is just tackle it really, get stuck in, see what happens. Let's take it apart first. Very simple guitar to work on, great access, there you go, uh, the control panel comes off separately to the pickup, so that bodes well. So I thought I knew what I was doing, but you never really know until you try something, do you? Well, there's only one way to find out, let's make a start. <laughs> I'm actually quite nervous. The moment of truth. Here we go. Oh well. <laughs> I have a signal. 8.54 kilo ohms. That should be that. Yes. <laughs> Get in. 7.96. Should be that. <laughs> Oh, it's only working. Incredibly, <laughs> yeah, incredibly. It all worked out and it sounded great too. I really find it hard to fault these Squire bullets because they're so cheap. And uh, you know, if if like me, you're stupid enough to to go and spend maybe twice as much again on pickups, you know, you, you're going to end up with a, a unique and original guitar that still costs around about 400 quid. So you kind of quids in really. I don't think you can lose, you know. And these guitars, you know, they're versatile. They'll do clean and they'll do distorted. There you go, there's a little bit of clean and a little bit of dirty for you there. If anyone sees in the comments today 
on this film, not today, whatever, forever, whenever, really. <laughs> not forever. Yeah, forever. These films are out there forever. Let me start again. If anyone sees someone says in the comments, it's all distorted, could you just correct them and say, no, it isn't, it's clean. We heard it. <laughs> okay. Bit more clean for you, see? There you go. There's no stopping me with the clean today. And dirty. Now, honourable mention must go, of course, to the mega Tokai upgrade project. Chinese Tokai. Thought we'd muck around with it. Upgrade the hardware and try loads of different pickups. This was the most complicated project of the year, trying to fit a Gibson spec wiring loom into an import guitar. What could go wrong? For those that are interested, you can join me now as I attempt to install uh, all the wiring in uh, a Chinese knockoff Les Paul. And obviously, this kit that you get from Monty's is designed for Gibson. Okay, I mean, it will go in Epiphones and Tokai's and other things, but there's going to be a few differences in the construction. So there's a whole series on this. I'll put a link in the description box. Pretty much everything that could go wrong did. <laughs> to the background of me playing my Gibson Les Paul, uh, which seems to be mocking me at every step. <sighs> okay. I'm back. All I'm going to say to you is if you do this, if you buy if you buy a wiring loom for a Tokai, don't buy the switch. Leave the switch in that's in there because this one doesn't fit and you have to bodge it, which I've done. It looks terrible. It's on the piss. And uh, it just doesn't fit really. So I'd be surprised if that still works now because I've crammed it in. Squeezed and squashed the wiring. So I'm not optimistic. What, sh what should have been a really pretty straightforward, nice job is turned into a right bodge job, really. Anyway, let's um, let's get on with it for fuck's sake. That up,
It's in. It's in. Can't tell you how relieved I am. I'm going to see if it works now. Um, I'll be surprised if it does. To be honest with you, I'll be surprised if it does. But here we are. <laughs> we made it through. It's now one of my one of my favourite affordable guitars. I think we've been through so much together. I couldn't possibly let it go. It's a keeper. Which leads me neatly onto the next guitar, which I did very nearly sell. This guitar, you know, it's a 1200 odd quid Gibson. It should be brilliant. It's not really. In fact, at the end of the comparison video, I said I was going to sell it. Um, and I did, in fact, stick it on reverb briefly. And then I came to my senses. <laughs> what are you doing, man? It's a Gibson SG Special. Don't sell it. Make it better. Fix it. I guess with the Tokai Les Paul upgrade under my belt at this point, I felt that this would be a breeze. I'm going to change the pots first, and then we'll have a listen, and then I'm going to change the pickups, and then we'll have another listen. But as usual, I decided to make it a lot more complicated than it really needed to be. But before I do that, something else I want to try first. In the, um, the comparison film that I did, we discovered that the pickups are mounted differently. So on this one, they've got, they've got metal plates underneath the pickups, which the pickups bolt onto for adjustment. Whereas on the others, on the Epiphone, it's got the, the foam, I think it was foam, maybe springs as well. And on the Custom Shop one, just screwed directly into the wood, as you can see from these picks. It has been suggested that the metal plates might make a, a difference to the sound. It might make a difference, and I'm just wondering if, if it might add to the brittleness that um, I can hear. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the metal plate out of this and replace it with a little bit of foam. And then see if that makes any difference. And then make a right meal of it. The problem I've encountered there is it's, there's a wooden channel running down the middle, so I'll need longer screws. Let me go and see what the other ones I've got are like. A little bit longer. Yeah, a little bit longer. Let, let me give, give that a try. Okay, I'm going to have to get a wooden block to put underneath that pickup so that I can do this, basically. So, let me go and find something. Okay, back from the garage. So, I've cut a couple of little bits of scrap wood, really. A little, couple of little bits of batten to, to fill the channel there. So, I'm just going to put one in for now. So, I suppose these should probably be glued in, but I kind of want this to be temporary, and I didn't really have time for that anyway. So, I've put a tiny little screw in the middle just to hold it to the body. Now, whatever you do, use a tiny little short screw because you don't want it coming out of the back of the, <laughs> the guitar. Uh, I made that mistake. <laughs> Here you go. Can you believe I did that? Unbelievable. Swat. I like to think that this is where the real value of subscribing to this channel becomes apparent. Yeah. You can watch as I literally screw things up uh, so that you don't have to. Here we go. Oh, do you know what? <laughs> I'm trying to put it in without taking the nuts off. I do always get there in the end, don't I? And here's the proof. <laughs> New CTS pots, witch hat knobs, Murray P90 pickups with black covers, some of you may have noticed, torque pit guard, 
and an extra little sound hole in the back. <laughs> it's now a keeper, definitely. Now, back in September, I finally heard <laughs> what so many people had been saying to me, and I bought my first Eastman. Sorry, I'm waving a knife at you. I shouldn't be doing that. It's dangerous. Not that dangerous, obviously, because it's a dinner knife, but obviously it means I'm poised to do another unboxing. You know that because you saw the thumbnail. And as you saw in the thumbnail, it's an Eastman. And I'm very excited because so many people have said, get an Eastman. They're brilliant. Um, so I've got an Eastman to find out if they are brilliant. I have no idea. I'm really looking forward to this one. Probably because of the thumbnail, but this film turned out to be my most successful of the year with over 100,000 views in a fairly short space of time. Also turned out to be one of my favourite guitars, not just of the year, but of, of all time. Here we go. It's our first Eastman on the channel. And it is... Well, they call it. <laughs> I can see it in the camera there. You can't see what it is yet, can you? That shot's not great because it's got it's full of bubble wrap. So I'm going to get it out and show you. Oh man, <laughs> it's a DC Junior. Did my usual badly researched history. Quite a new company. They're they're a Chinese company. They're based in Beijing in China where they've got a workshop. So they're a Chinese company that make guitars in China. And um, I understand they were founded in just 1992 by uh, a professional musician called Chan Ni. Chan Ni. And I believe my pronunciation's bang on there. Okay. Um, I'm quite confident in that, but you know, feel free to correct me. Chan, spelt Q-I-A-N, I think about that. Q-I-A-N, Ni. Uh, N-I, as in the knights that like to say knee. You know what I mean? The obscure Python reference, big hit with my target demographic. Bakelite gag, not so much. Tumbleweed. Bakelite pit guard. I believe that's Bakelite. I'm sure I read in the specs that that's Bakelite, which is what they used to make them out of back in the day. And it uh, also means that if the guitar is involved in a fire at any point, um, you will be left with the pit guard. Lovely tortoise shell, of course, as well. I shouldn't, I shouldn't fail to mention that. I think the look is just, <laughs> you know, isn't it? I love DC Juniors. This particular one, really lightweight, vintage feel, Lola P90, just blew me away. I hope my playing and the sound that I got out of it has done it justice because this is truly an amazing guitar. This is one of the best guitars that I've ever played. That's quite an endorsement, isn't it? Don't forget, no one was paying me to do this review, so I meant every word. So, of course, then within a matter of weeks, I got this one. It's another Eastman I've sneaked in without telling you about. They call this the SB55SC. 
my excuse was I wanted to compare this one with my Gibson and Epiphone Les Paul Juniors. Only one of them's a Gibson. One of them's an inspired by Gibson. <laughs> and then this one here is the surprise newcomer. I've recently been turned on to Eastman guitars. So I had to buy this. Broadly the same price as the Gibson, but I think it's got some surprises. Um, so that's kind of what we'll do today. We'll, we'll compare all three. We're going to have a, a real close look at all of these and we're going to take them apart and, and measure everything and weigh everything and poke it all around, okay? Until we come up with something to talk about at the end. An Eastman standout feature is definitely the, the antique varnish finish. This is what they call their antique varnish finish. It comes across as slightly relict. It has got scratches on it. In fact, that scratch there I've put on that. This finish does mark very easily. I will tell you that now, guys, a lot easier than nitrocellulose. So be aware of that. You're buying a guitar that is from new, kind of got a light relicking on it, which as well as being incredibly tactile and attractive is very easy to make cheap jokes about. This is hand finished. This is an antique varnish, which is kind of like a French polishing <laughs> job. That's not a, one of those sexual innuendos that they used to use back in the 70s, by the way. This is, um, this is, <laughs> I can't believe I said that. This is, it's, it's hand rubbed. I'm digging deeper into a hole, isn't I? Yeah, it's, it's that, isn't it? It's, it's, it's got that antique varnish finish, layers of varnish put on by hand and it can gives it this effect, it's, there you go. And they're all quite unique because they're done by hand and they will continue to relic quite quickly, I imagine. So as I say, that's just a little scratch that I've put on here. Is it a scratch or is it muck from, oh, again, <laughs> it's not a scratch at all. <laughs> it's, oh, you know what that was? <laughs> I'm gonna tell you this. I had a plaster on my thumb because I decided to do some motorcycle maintenance and within a minute I cut my finger. Anyway, it's all right now, don't worry. So as much as I love my Gibson Les Paul Jr. old scratch, you remember? Yeah, I've got a bond with that guitar. I mean, I've got a bond that we've forged through the adversity, the experience that we've shared. But, uh, you know, it's a great guitar, but it's, it's flawed, as you know. It's got, it's got issues, uh, not least with, you know, the, the paintwork and the stuff that I've complained about, but you know, stuff like the tuners, they're not, they're not top notch. The hardware on original series Gibsons, they're not great, you know. It's all, you know, it's all a bit, you know. The pots, they're not great, are they? All that stuff. It's okay. Whereas, you know, stuff like this, this Eastman stuff, it's just, it's the best stuff you can get, really. So, it, there's, it makes a difference, you know. They're not flawed like the Gibsons, in, in my mind. You 
always get some problems with, with Gibsons. Not necessarily talking about custom shop ones, but the original series Gibsons. There is something wrong, you know, iffy tuners, QC issues, something or other. And you know, I've, I've, I've got this, you know, still ongoing internal dialogue with myself about whether or not I should keep my Les Paul Standard 50s, my Gibson. You know, whether, I like, whether or not I like it. Whether or not I like it, yeah. I sold my R8. You know I sold my R8. UPS lost it, but they found it again, fortunately. So, as far as Les Pauls go, I'm still searching for the one. Now, these two Eastmans, the SC and the DC that I've just, you know, we just talked about, they led me to a need to try Eastman's SB59, the varnish. And I was blown away. So although I have loved pretty much every guitar <laughs> that I've bought and reviewed this year, the, the Epiphone Power Player doesn't count. I didn't like that one at all. I'm not sure if there were any other guitars that I disliked as much as that. But I've pretty much liked everything, and I've loved a lot of them. We've seen some fantastic guitars. This three-part roundup, this is part three, as you know. If you haven't seen parts one and two, I'll put a link to the whole series in the description box. Check them out. I think it covers pretty much every guitar that we've looked at this year. There's been some fantastic guitars. There's been some great guitars. There's been some good guitars. And as far as I can remember, there's only been one bad guitar. Okay. But my guitar of the year, my discovery of the year was, of course, this. My SB59 Eastman, which didn't cost as much as a Gibson Les Paul original. It cost £1,700 I paid for it, and it's stunning. It's a stunning guitar. Um, I didn't even think I liked Les Pauls that much until I got this, and I found this one very, very hard to put down. So, yeah, I. <laughs> that's what it is. Um, my guitar of the year, the Eastman. SB 59. So that's it folks, that's the end of our 2022 programme here on The Guitaristas. All that remains is for me to say a, a genuine thank you for, for watching, for supporting the channel, um, you know, for every comment, for every view, for every like, for every subscribe, it's just massively appreciated. So we'll be back next year, um, until then, have a good celebration, whatever it is you're doing and I'll see you on the other side, I hope. Cheers for now. Ta-da.